Hi, welcome to ME313, Mechanical Engineering Thermodynamics. The topic of this video is oblique, mock, and expansion waves, and the section of the textbook is 17.5. Here are the learning outcomes. At the end of this, you'll understand how to analyze an oblique shock wave. You'll be able to calculate the two downstream conditions of an oblique shock wave. You'll know what a mock wave is. You'll understand what causes an expansion wave and you'll recognize the Prandtl-Meyer relationship for analyzing an expansion wave. So first I want to talk about oblique shock waves. And an oblique shock wave is different than what we looked at before, which would be called a normal shock wave. In a normal shock wave, the shock wave plane is normal to the direction of flow. And an oblique shock wave is at an oblique angle. So here's a, in this diagram, this is a, a model of the space shuttle. And it's in a supersonic wind tunnel. And what you see on here forming is a shock wave and it's forming at an angle to the direction of flow. So flow is coming in this direction here and what you recognize is that for example if we look at the plane right there on the front of the nose the fluid that comes in must turn and flow along the side of this. So what you have is a turning of the flow and you're more or less compressing the material and what this causes as you compress the material is to go from a supersonic condition to a slower condition, sometimes even a subsonic condition, as you uh, turn in the flow as the material becomes uh, more compressed. And so here's an angle of the shock wave, and that's an angle is a little bit greater than the turning angle, and as you see that the boundary layer between the shock wave and the surface here gets larger with time, or with direction as we move through it. So here's a, here's a diagram from the textbook to kind of get a better picture of this. So this is an idealized rocket nose, for example, a pointed cone, and the half angle of the cone is delta, and the flow that's coming in at upstream of the shock wave, so that would be called Mach sub 1, is coming in, and then it has to turn, and it's going to turn an angle theta, and what you recognize if you think about the material that's just above the point of this, it clearly must turn at the same angle as the half angle of the nose, so we know that delta is essentially equal to theta. Those angles are the same. So the turning angle is the same as the half angle of the nose. And then what we have is a um, shock wave, an oblique shock wave. It forms at a larger angle. That angle is marked here as beta. And the downstream velocity is MA2. Now what we'll see is that Mach 2, or sorry, MA2, uh, may or may not be supersonic depending on the angle. So in order to analyze this, what we're going to do is we're going to put a control volume right here across the shock wave. And so that's what I show on the bottom diagram here. So I've kind of turned it. So this black line right over here is the shock wave. And now if you consider the material coming in, I'm going to have the upstream on the top. Um, I have flow coming in at some particular angle, like this upstream. And then it gets turned, and I move at a sharper angle in this direction. And one of the things you might notice is that if I was looking at the amount of material that goes into my control volume, the amount coming in on this side is clearly going to be the same as the amount going out on that side, because these velocities are the same and the angles are the same. And the same thing can be said down here, in that the amount of material going into my control volume on the left is the amount that's leaving on the right. So really all I need to do is look at the normal component, that of this coming at the top, and do my mass balance, my momentum balance, and my energy balance on the normal component of velocity coming in and the normal component of the velocity going out. So it sort of turns into a geometry problem. And so here's another diagram from the textbook where here I have my upstream velocity V1, which is the same as Mach 1. And then I've got my normal component, and my normal component is going to depend on beta. And then I've got V2 coming here, and its normal component is going to depend on beta and on delta. So there's going to be some relationship between my velocities and beta and theta. And remember, theta and delta are the same value. And so what you need to do now is some geometry. And fortunately for us, somebody else has done that geometry. This gentleman here, perhaps, has done all that geometry for us and come up with a relationship. And that relationship is called the theta-beta Mach relationship. It's this equation here from the textbook. And what this is is a relationship between theta, which is right here, it's the turning angle, which remember is the same as the half angle of the cone here, delta and theta. Delta is essentially equal to theta. I've got my upstream velocity, Mach 1, and then I have my angle beta, which is 
the angle at which the um, shock wave forms. Now, what happens, though, with this kind of relationship is this isn't particularly easy to use because what you tend to know is theta. You tend to know the half angle of your rocket nose, and you're trying to solve for beta. So this is sort of an implicit equation. So it's not necessarily the most easy to use. You can use an equation solver to solve it, um, or you can go ahead and use the figure out of the textbook, which I show here on the bottom. Now, before I explain the figure, let me just mention there is an, a uh, typo, and I believe it's um, edition 7 of the textbook. So notice up here on the top, this is COT, this is cotangent. I believe it's um, miswritten in one of the other previous versions of the textbook. So the form, uh, the correct equation has the cotangent up in there on the top, cotangent data. Now this equation here um, is graphed down in this plot down here. So what we have is we have theta over on the y-axis and beta on the x-axis. And as I said, we normally know theta because we know the, the geometry of our rocket. And so, and we may know the upstream velocity, because that's effectively the velocity which the rocket is going. And what we're trying to do is find beta. So that means you know your y value, and then you know your Mach number, which is each one of these blue lines. So what you would do is, so let's go ahead and say we were at Mach 3, which is this value here, and we had a half angle of 10 degrees. Well, we'd look across and find out that it intersects the line at that point. If I drop down there, I'd find out that my um, beta angle is, oh, maybe about 27 degrees. But if you also notice, there's another line that crosses again right over here down at maybe, oh, 87 degrees. There's actually two angles. And so what we see is that there's two possible angles that can form right up here now that we can have. And so I've got a beta value to there, and I have a beta value over here. So those are called the strong and the weak shock waves. The strong wave, as it's marked over here in the diagram, the strong wave is at the, a um, closer to a 90 degree angle and this right over here results in a downstream velocity that is subsonic so Mach 2 is less than 1 it is subsonic on the right and if it doesn't turn into that much of an angle we still actually remain with a supersonic downstream it's slowed down but it is still supersonic so downstream we can have a weak shock wave or a strong shock wave and which one forms is a little beyond what we need to analyze in this class what we'll be doing is just solving for both values when we, when we do some examples so, a couple of, just kind of summarize what the steps are for calculating an oblique shock wave. And the thing to remember is all we need to really be concerned with are the normal components of the shock wave. And so what you're going to do is it's sort of a four-step process. First, go to that diagram or the equation to determine the oblique shock wave beta. And that may be for either the strong or the weak angle. We'll do the, the process the same. So we're going to just start off with the strong angle. Go and find out what your value of beta is. And then you're just going to use some geometry to find the normal component. So right here's the normal component. This is the actual component. So we just need to know, for example, what the sine of beta is in order to get the normal component. And then we're going to go ahead and treat that normal component, I call it MA1 normal, as the upstream supersonic velocity and analyze that like a normal shock wave. Um, so we'll go ahead and go to like table A33 and find our downstream Mach number. But this is actually going to be the normal component of the downstream Mach number. And so then I'll do is just reconvert that into my absolute. So I'm going to calculate the actual velocity V2 or Mach number 2. Again, using geometry, now I'm going to be using uh, beta and also going to be using delta in order to find out what its actual component is given the normal component. So that's what I'm going to use. Table A33, the normal shock wave tables, and that means normal in terms of, of the direction, to analyze the two com normal components. All right, so let's go ahead and... And I'll just do an example to kind of show you how this works. So here I have a, a rocket nose. It's got a total um, angle here of 40 degrees. Um, and it's flying at Mach 2. So it effectively looks like the, the air is coming in at Mach 2. And the atmosphere is 10 degrees. And what the example wants me to do is to find the downstream velocity. So downstream of a shock wave. And it tells me to go ahead and look at the strong shock wave. So this is going to be the one that forms at a, a sharper angle right there. And I want to go ahead and find out what is the velocity at that point. Okay. So first thing I need to do is to go ahead and find my beta angle. And so what I'm going to use is um, my half angle. So the half angle, if this whole thing is 40, the half angle theta, which is the turning angle, is equal to 20 degrees. So I'm going to use 20 degrees um, to go ahead and find out what my my theta angle is right there. So I'm going to go over to this diagram here. Right? And so what I was was at 20 degrees in a Mach number of 2. 
So we'll come over here, and I'm going to go ahead and find my um, strong shock wave. And oh, sorry, the strong one is on the right hand side. And so it looks like it's at about 74 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and use 74 degrees as my theta angle. So now I'm back over here. Theta is equal to 74 degrees. So now I need to find the normal component. So MA1 normal component. And I need to do is multiply by the sine of 74 degrees. So this diagram down here, you can realize there's my theta angle. If I want the normal component, it would be the sine of 70. So there's my Mach number of 2 times the sine of 74 degrees. And that gives me a 1.92. So the normal component upstream is Mach number 1.92. Right, so now what I need to do is to go ahead and find my downstream normal component. So now I go to table A33. So here's table A33, and my upstream was 1.92, so I'm just right about here somewhere. Um, and then, which means my downstream Mach number is going to be just a little bit below uh, 0 0.59. So that's going to be my downstream Mach number. So let's say that the, you go ahead and use this equation if you want a more accurate number, but I think it's about 0 0.59. So that's the normal component downstream. And now what I need to do is go ahead and convert this back into my actual velocity. So I want this component here. So now notice I've got my beta angle, which is going here. But I, what I need to do is I need to go ahead and subtract the delta. So I'm going to actually be going to be beta minus delta that I'm using. So my actual Mach number 2 is going to be 0 0.59, the normal component. And I divide because I'm doing it the reverse. And I'm going to go ahead and do the sine of 74 minus 20 which is beta minus delta, and that gives me a number of 0 0.73. So that's that's my downstream Mach number. It's subsonic. This is the actual Mach number. Um, and now what it wants is it wants the, the downstream velocity, which means I need to know the speed of sound in order to determine what this value is. So what I need to do is, is look at what my relative temperatures are. I got my upstream temperature at 10 degrees Celsius, or which would be 283 Kelvin. And I need to determine my downstream temperature. So I'm going to go back over here to table A33, but now I'm looking at the ratio of the temperatures. So again, my ratio of temperatures over here, and it's just a little greater than 1.6, say maybe 1.62. So let's go ahead and do that. We know that T2 over T1 is going to be equal to 1.62. And that right there is the downstream temperature over 283. So that's going to go ahead and give me a T2 value of 458 Kelvin. So it's warmer. It's slowed down. That kinetic energy is, is turned into some thermal energy. And now in order to get the velocity, let's go ahead and find our speed of sound, our speed of sound, which is the square root of KRT2. I plug those values in there. This is about 429 meters per second. K is 1.4 and R is 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And so now I can go ahead and find out what V2 is, the downstream velocity, which means I'm going to be multiplying my Mach number times the speed of sound that I just calculated there. And that comes out to 313 meters per second. So there right there is the downstream velocity of this 313. Okay. Um, let me talk about a couple of just interesting aspects of, of shock waves. Um, there's something called a Mach wave. And so first, if I look at this diagram, remember this is the one that's my uh, theta beta Mach number relationship, which gives us, given what the turning uh, turning angle is, we can go ahead and find the angle of the Mach wave of this value of beta. Um, and one of the interesting things you'll see is that there's a turning angle that would be zero degrees. And effectively, so for example, say at Mach 3, there's this value. It tells me that I've got a beta angle of like 20 degrees and also one at 90, you know, the, the fluid doesn't turn at all. So remember, again, theta is the turning angle. And so it tells me that if there was no turning angle at all, um, I would still be forming a wave of some sort, and that's actually um, at a particular angle, theta. And that's what's called a Mach wave. And so this diagram, you can actually kind of subtly see some Mach waves. So here's my primary oblique shock wave. But if you look, you'll see some kind of look like striations in the Schlieren diagram here. And effectively what's happening is you have fluid moving right along parallel to the surface of this, and maybe there's some small imperfection or a bump in this. And what that does is it causes a wave to form, 
And so, but there's no turning of a fluid. The fluid keeps moving by. That's theta equal to zero. Theta equal to zero doesn't, but there's this little wave that's forming up. So that's what we kind of see, though. Those are mock waves. And they tend to get formed when there's um, any sorts of imperfections or bumps um, in the surface that this fluid is running across. That's called a mock wave. And as I said, there's potentially no turning of the flow. So if I was to, maybe if I look over in this diagram here, maybe my imperfection is there. The fluid is coming here. Okay, but the fluid doesn't turn, but I get a mock wave forming in that way. And the mock waves, they, they tend to be almost nearly isentropic. They're kind of small. They're even kind of a little difficult to see in this diagram. Um, if I want to go ahead and figure out what the angle it forms at, I can come back to that same relationship I had before. This is the theta beta mock number relationship. But now my turning angle is zero. So I'm taking the tangent of zero, which is zero. And now I can go ahead and rearrange this equation. It gets a little simpler here to go ahead and find out what my beta angle is. And it becomes out this simple relation here, arc sine of 1 over the Mach number. It's usually given this symbol mu here. So this mu is the turning angle of a Mach wave. Now I want to talk about another interesting thing. This is called an expansion wave. This is kind of a, a reverse of an um, oblique shock wave. And so this forms when... Um, for example, imagine here I have a, a rocket that's not completely pointed in the direction it's, it's flowing, so or uh, traveling. So the rocket's traveling this direction, but it's kind of turned at an angle. And what ends up happening is we get what's called an expansion wave, which is a whole bunch of, of Mach waves all coming off the cone here. And I have a with fluid, uh, flow change in velocity as I move through that's actually faster than, Mach 1, than the upstream, which is MA1. And if you think about what happens, you remember I got some fluid here it's moving across. Or actually, it's just kind of sitting there as this rocket nose comes. And then as this comes, it gets sucked down more or less on the right-hand side and actually has to travel faster than relative to this cone than it was before. And so what we find out is that the downstream velocity is actually larger. Here's another way you can get an expansion wave, which is just on the receiving side of a rocket. For example, here. So again, imagine I've got fluid coming across here and then it has to follow, follow the surface and it gets sucked down and its absolute velocity is somewhat larger. So as I said, sort of interesting, the downstream Mach number is actually greater than the upstream Mach number. It's, it's greater because it has to go faster than it was beforehand in order to fill in more material, more or less, as I'm coming in here. Um, now, if the Mach number is greater, that means that the temperature is going to decrease. And so T2, we realize, is less than T1. And so the temperature downstream is less than it is upstream. Um, in order to, to determine this angle, it gets pretty complicated, a little bit more than we really need to deal with in this class. It's something called the uh, um, Prandtl-Meyer relationship. And more or less, the relationship says, OK, if my, my expansion wave angle here is theta, I'm going to go ahead and, and evaluate my upstream and downstream Mach numbers with the function, that Prandtl-Meyer function. That's what's shown here as, as this Greek letter. And this is the equation. And as I said, it's a little beyond what we need to deal with in this class. Just recognize there is this relationship. And what you're going to do is you're trying to satisfy this equation. So if you knew, for example, what the decreasing angle is here. So for example, here in this diagram, it says uh, delta is equal to 10 degrees. So you would say that whole thing is equal to 10 degrees. We knew our upstream Mach number saying it was 2. Then in order to find the downstream Mach number, we go ahead and find something that's going to satisfy this equation here by using this function. We definitely get into the world of using computers and equation solvers to go ahead and, and determine that. Um, the one last thing I want to mention expansion waves on it, really related to this point I just made. The downstream temperature is less than the upstream temperature. Which, what we'll see here is a pretty interesting phenomenon, which you can see in this diagram here, um, is what you got is you've got an expansion wave forming on the tail end of this uh, jet here. And since the temperature decreases, the water falls below the dew point, and we actually get condensation. But once it gets off of the tail, it's going to go ahead and warm up again. And so you end up with this condensation cone that only appears very briefly. It actually it looks like it's attached to the back of this plane. And so if my video will play here, let's see if we can get this to play. There's a little YouTube video. It's actually pretty interesting to see. If you look closely, you can see there that, that um, cone that just kind of forms right along the edge of the plane. So let's see if we can replay that again and you look closely. It looks like it just kind of stuck to the tailing edge of the plane because we get condensation that quickly um, revaporizes after it goes back to um, 
subsonic flow, effectively no slow flow at all. 